We, we taught, uh, I taught in Sunday school this morning about atonement from Romans chapter 5 to those teenagers. And I remember this morning, even as I was thinking about it, I mean, we have some sharp teenagers in our youth group. I'm appreciative for their knowledge of Scripture. And I was thinking, man, this is, this is stuff that they've heard before. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks upside the head that this is truth. This atonement thing, this is good stuff. There's a reason why the songwriter wrote Amazing Grace. He's, he called it amazing because that's not a superlative when you truly understand what grace is. His grace truly is amazing and there's reason to praise him. 1 Samuel 25 this morning, 1 Samuel 25, a, a remarkable response, the title of the sermon this morning, a remarkable response. This is a narrative, this part of scripture is, and that just means it's just a story being told and so... I'm going to do my best this morning to get you up to the spot where we will read the text, but a narrative does take an imagination, and so I'll try to do my part to tell the story up to the point where we read the text, but it still takes your part, too, to try to paint the picture in your mind. So do your best this morning to pay close attention and follow uh, the, the story that's, that leads up to um, this passage of Scripture. There are three characters that we're going to be referencing in the passage of this morning. We have David who at the time is not yet king, but it's important to know he's running from the current king, which would be Saul. He's running from Saul. He's running for his life. The last time that they were together and that Saul saw David, he chucked a javelin at him. So I'm sure he's not hunting down David to give him a bro hug or anything like that. He's hunting him down for blood. He's hunting him down to kill him. And so David's running for his life along with his own men. And then we have Nabal. Nabal or Nabal as some say it. He's an evil man. If you know anything about Nabal, he is an evil man. His name literally means fool. So that tells you something right there, doesn't it? Uh, I don't understand what mother would like hold up their child and say, I have a perfect name for this child. I, I don't understand that. <laughs> fool. Yeah. That child's going to do great things. And then uh, we have Nabal's wife whose name is Abigail. Abigail. And this, uh, if you even read down in verse 3, it tells you a little bit about Nabal and Abigail. Verse 3 of chapter 25 says, Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doing, and he was of the house of Caleb. So that tells you a little bit about the two characters, Nabal and Abigail, doesn't it? So N Abigail, a woman of good understanding and of a uh, beautiful countenance, and then we have Nabal, the evil man, and then David. So here's what's happened up to this point, up to the point we're going to start reading there in about verse 23. But in this passage of Scripture, it's important to note that David has been hiding down in the ravines of the land. Now the way that the land is set up, there's a lot of ebb and flow to the to the geology of the, of the region there, and there are a lot of crevices and a lot of places where David's men can hide. And so there were caves and things that David's men would have uh, kept refuge in. But it took a lot to keep, they're mentioned in the text here, 600 men. It takes a lot of food to feed 600 men. And these weren't just men, there were teenage boys here too. And I am a youth pastor, I have seen teenage boys eat pizza and they put it away. So there's a lot of food that has to be supplied for, these, for David's men. So think about that for, as we go forward. So David's having to hide his men, but he has to also sustain his army in order to, if he does come up against Saul and his army, he can defend himself. So they're hiding. Well, where they are hiding, it just so happens to be where Nabal's fields would be. And Nabal was, an, was a very rich man. He owned a lot of sheep. He owned a lot of livestock. And this happened to be the fields in which Nabal would have had the sheep sheared. And so there were a lot of staff members on Nabal's crew who would have been shearing sheep during this time. Well, David's men always had the opportunity, if they wanted to, to go steal one of those sheep. Now, I love mutton. I like, I like, I like Greek food. I like, I like the, uh, is there another word for mutton? It's just, it's lamb's meat is, is all I really know it as. I was introduced to that here in Florida whenever I first moved here. Greek food, I love Greek food. I love the lamb's meat that they slice off and they put it in the gyro. I, I understand that's how you pronounce it. I'm guessing there's like a big debate on how you pronounce that. Hero or gyro or potato, Godzilla, I don't know. But you, <laughs> Uh, um, the lamb's meat, they were probably looking at these lambs saying, now that looks, that'd be good on a pita right there, that lamb. 
But that, that lamb didn't belong to them. That, that belonged to Nabal. And the text says it this way. They touched not Nabal's. They touched not what was Nabal's. And David instructed them not to. They were tempted to, I imagine. They were probably pretty hungry people. And actually, David's men started to come into this conflict here because they needed sustenance. They needed food, but they were running low on supplies. So David reached out to Nabal, and he said, We have shown you favor. Will you show us favor in return? We didn't take anything that was yours. In fact, we've kind of guarded your sheep for you. We've, we've been a help to you. So will you... Show us favor, because we've shown you favor. So David sends out those men to Nabal, and they arrive, and they talk to Nabal, and they say, will you show us favor? David just needs some sub substance. We need some food. We need some rations. Will you supply that for us? Nabal's response is, who is this David? Now, he knew who David was. He knew exactly who David was. Everyone knew who David was. Everyone knew that Saul and David were in this in this um, scuffle, and they were uh, fighting against each other. But it was more like, who do you think you are to ask me for help? I never once asked for David's help. Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse that you speak of? You tell him that if he's taken care of himself this long, he can continue to take care of himself. And he sends David's men back to him. As you can imagine, David did not take that well. David showed great favor to Nabal and to his herdsmen and to his shepherds. And those men knew it who were out there in the fields. But David, who had shown favor to them, was given this response of, who do you think you are? You defend yourself. Meanwhile, there's a servant in the household of Nabal who hears David's men come in, David's messengers come in and talk to Nabal and they see David Nabal's response and how harsh it is. And so a wise messenger goes straight over to Abigail, who was a woman of good understanding, and he reports to her, hey, it's about to go down. I'm telling you, David sent men. He's only been kind to us. He never took anything that wasn't his. He's been great to us. And Nabal acted exactly like you'd expect him to, exactly what his name means, a fool. So David's probably on his way right now. So will you do something? And so Abigail does. What she does is she gathers together. You look at verse 18. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep, ready dressed, and five measures of parched corn and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. And she sends those ahead. She sends those rations ahead of her. And then she gets on her own donkey and she starts riding behind the rations that she sends ahead to David. Somewhere on the trail from David getting to where his ravine was, where he was hiding out, to Nabal, Abigail and David meet up. And the text actually says David rose up against Abigail. He knew who Abigail was, and he was still a little bit frothy about what happened. He's still a little bit upset. So he comes up against Abigail, but what happens next, and where we pick up our text, is so incredible and is so rich and so powerful. I just want to walk through this slowly. And this is where we pick up our text. You look at verse 23. This is Abigail seeing David. She runs up to David and here's what she does. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground. Now this doesn't make any sense. A, the wife of a rich man who really doesn't have to do this comes up to David and t catches him completely off guard and she falls flat on her face. And she begins to treat David, as we see in the preceding verses, she begins to treat David as if he is already the man that she hopes he will be. And now, ladies, let me tell you something. This works on us guys every single time, even if we know you're doing it. In other words, a lady could go up to a man, like my wife could come up to me and say, I bet you can carry in all these groceries in one trip. <laughs> or I bet you can carry this trash can full of garbage out to the curb with one arm. And I'm sitting there going, I know what you're doing, but I can do that. <laughs> I, and so I present my strength to, to my woman. David knows exactly what she's doing, but it still works. She begins to treat David as if he's already the man that she hopes he will be. Abigail is so smart. 
she begins to speak to David's potential. She looks past what's happening currently and she speaks to David's future. And it's powerful, the impact that it has on, has on David. Look at verse 24. And fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, and let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. She's not his servant, but she's being subservient. Now, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation within our culture today. This is not teaching women, you should come and bow before a man. That is not it. If that happened in our culture today, that would be really weird. And it would probably show up on Twitter everywhere with really nasty hashtags. <laughs> that would be really weird in our culture today. But in this culture, it kind of made sense. You understand it's a different culture in a different place in a different time. So this made sense in their culture. There's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but subservience the attitude of being a servant to somebody, there is a correlation within our culture today. And it's rare that it's accessed. Wouldn't you agree to that? It's rare that we see subservience in our culture today. Verse 25, Abigail continues to speak. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial. She's speaking about her own husband here. Husbands, pay attention. You don't want your wife to describe you this way. <laughs> Regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. What does his name mean again? Fool. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord, whom thou didst send. In other words, she's saying this. Don't pay any attention to Nabal. He's a fool. He's just like his name means. He's foolish. And then she does this Jedi mind trick thing here in the verses following verse 26 and 27 if you don't know what star wars is you'll still get this verse 26 and 27 jedi mind trick that was that reference there now therefore my lord as the lord liveth okay let me say this too before we read these next verses anytime you see lord in lowercase letters she's referring to david anytime you see lord in capital letters she's referring to jehovah god just so there's clarity there now therefore my lord david as the lord god liveth and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. This is what she's doing. You're not going to do what you're planning to do. It's almost like uh, this mind trick that she's playing on David. You're not going to do what you're about to do, right, David? And she goes on. She gives him credit. Notice what she's doing here. She gives him credit for being a better man than he actually is being. She gives him credit for being a better man than he's actually being at the time. Verse 28, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord David a sure house. She speaks to his future, doesn't she? Because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, Jehovah, God, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. Now she's not inflating his ego. Understand, that's not what she's doing. That can be a tactic of many people today, is that we try to inflate someone else's ego to make them feel better about themselves so they do what we want them to do. That's not what she's doing. She's centering all this around Jehovah, God. That's not inflating one's, one's ego. That's turning one's attention and one's conscience to the one that can change things in the situation. That's what's important here. She's saying, because you fight for God, and then she says this, because she knows that Saul's looking for David. It's no secret. Verse 29, yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. The words she's using here, the bundle of life, it's referring to like a leather a strap that people would put around or a purse that people would carry their valuables in. They would carry coins in or they would carry currency in or they would carry important documentation in. And people would wrap this leather strap around it. It would be the modern equivalent of like a wallet. You would put important things in here. And so my ID is in here and no cash is in here. But... <laughs> uh, a lot of cards, a lot of plastic is in there. But that would be the equivalent, the modern equivalent. They would wrap it around their belongings and they would tuck it in their belt. It was the most secure and safest that a thing could be on a person. And 
Abigail is saying this about David. God has wrapped you up like in his wallet, and he's put you in his, in his belt. You're safe, David, because you fight the battle of the Lord. Verse 29, yet a man has risen up to pursue thee. Look at the second part of the verse. And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out, as out of the middle of a sling. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Just a few chapters earlier, David's standing down in a valley facing a giant. And David is immediately reminded, this is not me that did this. This is only God. Even David himself, who was thinking so clearly at the time and knew exactly who, whose side he fought on, stood before the giant Goliath and knew that he could not in his own power take down a giant of that magnitude. But through the power of God was able to take down that giant. And immediately, Abigail is speaking not only to his potential, but to his past as well. And to the victory that David had seen in his own life. And how powerful it is. The next section of scripture here, she pretty much essentially poses this question. David, what story do you want to tell? when this is nothing but a story that you tell. David, what story do you want to tell your kids someday when this instance is nothing but a story that you tell? Verse 30, And it came to pass, when the Lord shall have done, and it shall come to pass, and when the Lord shall have done to my Lord, according to all of the good that he has spoken concerning thee, and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel, she's, she's saying, you're going to be king, that this shall be no grief unto thee, nor offensive heart unto my Lord, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt with, well with my Lord, then remember that handmaid. In other words, one day, David, when you're king, you're going to look back on this and you're going to be glad that you did not act harshly in this situation. You're going to be glad that you did not shed blood that didn't even need to be shed. David, what you do in this moment, and there's a correlation here today. What you do in this moment will one day be a permanent part of that story that you tell. You don't want this causeless massacre to take place. You don't want this needless conflict to be in that story, do you? Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel which sent thee this day to meet me. And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with mine own hand. Look at verse 35. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted thy person. And so David changed his mind. Now you have to understand, in this day and age, in this culture that he was in, there was nothing but pure adrenaline and testosterone flowing through his veins. And all he wanted to see was blood shed, Nabal's blood shed, because he had helped him. And he gave good to Nabal, and Nabal returned evil for that good. That's maniacal, that Nabal would react in such a way. And it kind of made sense that, that David would respond in like, wouldn't it? kind of made sense in, that David would turn against Nabal and say, okay, I'll show you who means business now. You go up against the Lord's anointed, and David had authority to say that because David was the Lord's anointed. Samuel had just died earlier in this passage of scripture, but Samuel had anointed David king of Israel. David knew what was to come, and he said, you're going up the, against the Lord's anointed, and I have every right to come up against you and thrust my sword through you, and David's men didn't really oppose it. It made sense. It made sense. To a degree. So David told Abigail to return. So Abigail is so smart in what she does because she went back home. And of course she planned to tell her husband exactly what had happened. And she finds the ball actually in a feast and partying and he's as drunk as can be. And so she thinks this is not a good time to talk to, talk to my husband. And there's wisdom in that. So she waits until the next morning, and look at the text, verse number um, 37. But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. 
And it, and it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. David didn't even have to do anything. God takes care of his own. God took care of the situation. Yes, there, there was something done that shouldn't have been done. Nabal reacted harshly. But God took care of David, didn't he? And so after Nabal died, I love this part. And then David sent word asking Abigail to become his wife. And Abigail quickly got on a donkey, went and became his wife. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> I made up that last part. They did. They were happy for a while. Isn't that a great story? I, I love this story. This is one of the keynote stories in Scripture and one of my favorite stories and accounts in Scripture. In summary, here's what we have. We have three characters, three responses, but only one hero. Three characters, three responses, only one hero. We have Nabal who returned evil for good because David did good to him. He returned evil for good. We have David who was intent on returning evil for evil. And that kind of made sense, didn't it? And, but we have Abigail, who returns good for evil. Nabal is maniacal. David, predictable. But Abigail is remarkable. Her response is remarkable. Amen. And there's a sense in which Abigail was way ahead of her time, too. Because back in the Old Testament, it did make sense that when somebody showed evil to, the, uh, to God's man, that they would respond with judgment. And God carried out judgment pretty swiftly back then. Now, there was much mercy shown by God. There were many opportunities for, for people to turn from their ways and to repent. God was not vindictive and unjust. Every judgment that God has ever proclaimed and sent out has been one of a just judgment. God is a God of just judgment. He's also a God of mercy and love. Abigail was way ahead of her time because you go over to the New Testament and we have something called this New Covenant now. And Jesus Christ brought this on the scene. And we have in the, in the New Testament when Jesus was on the scene here, Peter who walked with Jesus and watched Jesus who was unjustly crucified, who was unjustly beaten, who was unjustly mocked. They showed him evil. Jesus only returned evil with good. And Peter, who watched that, wrote these words, recompense to no man, evil for evil. But, Corey, look what they did to me. Do you understand what they did to me? Yeah, but recompense no, to no man, evil for evil. Yeah, but do you know what they said about me? Do you understand the turmoil that I'm in now? Do you see how they treated me? Yes, but don't repay evil for evil. But they refused to give me respect. They, here's a common word we hear nowadays, offended me. Yeah, they probably did. Because that's the nature of man. But with something that's remarkable that is not the nature of man is to recompense to no man evil for evil, but to, on the contrary, return evil with blessing, with good. In other words, when you're mistreated, don't do nothing or go neutral. That's a common response too, isn't it? That we, that we would just clam up and say nothing. Well, if I said what, they, what I wanted to say, then that would be evil. Well, God doesn't say do nothing either. He doesn't say go neutral. He doesn't say go quiet. He says return evil with good. Amen. Well, if I do nothing, they'll take advantage of me. God never said do nothing. He said return evil with good. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 wrote these words, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Pay close attention to these next words. Hear me very closely. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That's some pretty heavy words. Those are some pretty heavy words. God is against them that do evil. God is against them that return evil for evil. Jesus himself said, if you're not convinced yet, 
Matthew chapter 5. If you have a red letter Bible, these words are in red. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. In other words, Jesus is saying this was commonplace. In your culture, in the Jewish culture, in the Old Testament culture, it was normal for you to think, I'm going to hate my enemy because they're my enemy. But Jesus flips everything on its head. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I'm going to say this. Refusing to return evil for evil might be one of the most Christ-like things that you could ever do. Refusing to return evil for evil might be one of the most Christ-like things that you could ever do. Do you see how Abigail was so far ahead of her time? And why this had such an impact on King David, who would be king? So in closing, I have three questions for you. Two questions for everyone. The last question is for Christians. Now, I hope everyone in here is a Christian, but I, I'm not, I'd be remiss to assume that. It could be that there's somebody in here who doesn't know that heaven is their home. But I have two questions for everyone, and one question specifically for Christians. Question number one. Do I really want to be even? Do I really want to be even with somebody that I don't even like? To get even with somebody you don't like is to be like somebody that you don't like. Do you want to be like someone you don't like? No. Well, then why would we do what they do? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the grand scheme of time and things. Even is easy, isn't it? Even is natural. Even is easy. Easy, it even makes sense to some degree. Wouldn't it be better, though, instead of getting even, to be ahead? Well, how do I get ahead? How do I know how I can pull ahead? Well, you pull ahead by refusing to get even. Pull ahead by refusing to, to get even. So question number one, do I really want to be even with somebody I don't even like? Question number two, what story do you want to tell when this is nothing but a story that you tell. Everything we do becomes a part of the story that we tell, whether you like it or not. Whether it's verbally said to your children someday, whether it's verbally said to your grandchildren someday around um, a bedtime story, and I'll tell you what Grandpa did. He got even. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a great story. Every single thing that you do while it may not be a verbal story that you tell, it still will be a story that you tell because every single one of us have what's called a reputation. Amen. And you're building a reputation whether you like it or not. And if you're returning evil with evil, you're building a, a predictable structure. It's predictable when you return evil for evil. But it isn't remarkable. The boss gets in your face at work and embarrasses you in front of the other employees. How does that story end? Teenagers, a bully, a bully threatens you or puts you down and shames you in front of your peers. What do you do? Yeah, it, gets real, it gets real tough in the moment, doesn't it? It's real easy for us sitting in a cushioned pew on a Sunday morning to replay this in our mind. But when the going gets tough, when the situation actually happens, that one relative that always, every single time they come around, they always have to correct you. Like if you say something that is not right, they have to correct you. And sometimes when you're correct, they still have to correct you. You know what I'm talking about? That one church member that literally all they do is gossip. I mean, the only reason that they come to church is just to catch up on gossip. <laughs> How does that story end? <clears throat> that one friend that stabbed you in the back. That one friend that's not talking to you anymore. That one friend that offended you. I'll tell you, it's predictable to return evil for evil, but it definitely is not remarkable. Question number three. We're done. As a Christian, you don't really get an option on this one, by the way. As a Christian, you've chosen to follow Jesus Christ. You've chosen to adopt what Christ would do. Amen. What would it look like for you to return good for evil? What would it look like for me as a Christian to return good for evil? When you think about him, when you think about her, when you think about them... 
When you think about your ex, or you think about your ex-employer, or you think about that son or daughter, or that prodigal son or that prodigal daughter who's gone off and offended you, you think about your parent or your dad and how he's treated you, or your mother and how she's treated you, and you think about that neighbor, whoever it is, whatever situation, what would it look like in that specific incident, in that specific relationship, for you to return good for evil? What would it look like to be a blessing to someone who's hurt you or offended you? Not just to do nothing and ignore them. That's easy to do. To return good for evil. To do nothing is mercy. To return good for evil, that is grace. And if you're a Christian, this is how our story intersects with the story of salvation. Because the greatest story ever told is a story of God returning good for evil. So if you're here today and you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, know this, you are a result of God choosing to return good for evil. Amen. He could have very well made a story that was predictable and returned evil for evil, but he chose something remarkable. He chose to redeem you. God giving his son for our evil if you're here this morning and you don't know heaven's your home, you know it's a choice that you make, whether or not you accept that gift. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. It's not, our, it's not our righteousness. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. It's not our good things that we do to earn His merit, to earn His favor. If you're here today, you don't know if you were to die today, because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. You don't know if you were to stand before God Almighty and he would say, welcome home. Or if he would say, depart from me. It's all centered around this one thing where God returned good for our evil. I have a feeling that in our American culture today that we can sometimes also mistake generosity and compassion for returning good for evil. Generosity and compassion, that's kind of a normal expectation in our culture today, to be honest. But returning good for evil, this, that's not expected. That takes you from predictable and expected over to remarkable. This will set you free because until you return good for evil, that other person really, they control you, don't they? And I'll, I'll prove to you how you know that they control you. Because you're like David, riding on his donkey, down through a ravine, thinking about all the ways that you're going to destroy them. Think about all the ways that you're going to respond the next time that they offend you. They control you. Nabal controlled David on that trip until Abigail showed up and had a remarkable response. So here's what David and Abigail would tell us this morning. Here's what David would say if he was standing right here in front of us this morning. Even is easy. Don't settle for even. Don't do it. Don't settle for even. Even is easy. Don't settle for predictable and write a predictable story. Make it remarkable. Do precisely for others what they don't deserve. Because when you do, you are like your Father in heaven. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. Let's heads bowed, eyes closed.